Don't try to sneak into your room like that. I know what you've got behind your back. Records. More no records. So let's talk about Mobile Fidelity. I don't think there are some people that don't know the history of Mobile Fidelity. So here is a British pressing of Steam Railroads Under Thundering Skies, recorded February 1961, the full force of Angry Skies Strike, Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Uh, and this is uh, licensed from Mobile Fidelity. And that's why if you look at the top here, that's why it's called Mobile Fidelity. They started out recording steam engines. And uh, it was uh, Brad Miller who did it. And this was licensed by uh, Argo, a division of Decca Records. And uh, you know, it's, I don't play this normally, but I think it's just a cool thing to have. It's a piece of history. As is the whole history of mobile fidelity. So let's talk about that. Because I've been around since the beginning of it. Not like some of these young whippersnappers. So this is the first mobile fidelity record that I bought. And this was an original master recording. Steely Dan Katie lied. Uh, the tape was pretty fresh. It's from 1975, and this came out only a few years later. And when you bought one of these original Mobile Fidelity records, you got this this documentation here, and it says half-speed master lacquer plating, quality plating from overseas, imported pressings from Japan, special high-definition vinyl, static-free inner sleeves, where only original source stereo masters are considered, and then only the very best are used. To emphasize contemporary artists and performances at last over what used to be done for audiophiles. Premium quality entertainment, limited quantities. Get yours today. Then on the inside is a review from the Absolute Sound in the early days. And this is a review of uh, I forget which record. Oh, this is this is a review of one of the one of the sound effects records from 1978. So obviously uh, this is this was probably around 78 or 79. It could even be a little bit later. I don't have the original date. Uh, this is their catalog in 1978. And it, yeah, so in 1978 they listed the Mystic Moods Orchestra, Super Tramp, Crime of the Century, John Clemmer Touch, Katie Lai, the LA Philharmonic doing uh, Star Wars. Uh, an early fall release coming up, Year of the Cat, Al Stewart, The Crusaders, Chain Reaction, George Benson, Breezen, and Fleetwood Mac. And coming very soon, Neil Diamond, The Who, Little Feet, Grateful Dead, Moody Blues, Joe Sample. This was at a time when, for rock-oriented audiophiles, you couldn't get this kind of audiophile pressing. And it was a fantastic innovation that many of us were thrilled to be able to have. And so, uh, as soon as this came out, even though it was pricey, I bought it, and it sounds really, really good. Uh, let's move forward to the Beatles box. This is a really interesting situation. So in 19, about 1982, Mobile Fidelity announced, and it may have been a little bit later than that, Mobile Fidelity announced they were doing the Beatles box, and they were going to be cutting these from the original master tapes. Now, this led to a lot of cynicism and speculation, just like there is now. And like there is now, there was not a great degree of transparency about it. So they released the box. And uh, at the time, I was either working for Walt Disney or I had just left Walt Disney. And I had uh, the ability to connect with somebody at Mobile Fidelity. I wasn't yet writing about audio. And I was able to get a, uh, a box set, an early example of the box set, at a discount. Sorry, I got it. Okay. And... Um, I got the box, and here's what's really, and really, so Stan and Ricker cut this half speed, and here's what's really, the first thing, the first weird thing I noticed was that the jackets show you, they show you the, um, the original British metal box that these tapes come in, because, you know, I was at Abbey Road, and I saw, I held the metal boxes of the mono set in my hand of Sgt. Pepper and uh, the Beatles, and a few others and it's a metal box and you can see the metal box and you can also see where every time it got signed out it would say where it got signed out to and i'm not going to go into the details about each of these boxes say because there are interesting, some interesting th things about that but what's notable about this and what's really amazing is despite the fact that the boxes all are for the exact record with the beatles and uh this one's for the Beatles, the White Album. The tape, the tapes they're showing in the boxes, that tape and that tape, different records, are the same tapes. 
They're the same tapes. They have the same number of tracks. It's the same picture that they've inserted into each of these boxes. I mean, it's just crazy. Like, how did the master tapes come to America? Did they really come to America? Did someone go to the UK and make copies? Or did somebody go to the UK with a digital recorder? And to the best that I can determine, as of now, what we know is that the tapes were hand carried to America and they were allowed to be in America for 48 hours. So Capital had. So Mofi had 48 hours to do to transfer how many records and how many lacquers. And so what they did, and this is all speculation because nobody ever came clean back then. The speculation is that for Sgt. Pepper, Abbey Road, and The Beatles, which are all the same uh, track configuration as the UK ones, they used Capitals Masters. That's the speculation. And that for the earlier records that were totally different, they did use those tapes and make the lacquers. Of course, whether these are any good or not is another subject of debate. It's certainly uh, the pressing, plating and pressing and mastering quality is top notch. These sound great in terms of pressing quality, but the EQ on these is was the weird what Stan would do. Stan Ricker, who was a friend of mine. What he would do is boost the bass. He was a bass player, and he would boost the treble a little bit. And what that would do is suck out the mid range. And so all the life that's in the mid range of the records that you want to hear kind of get sucked out. It's, so it has a very sterile sound. Then there are those people that say that uh, master tapes from EMI never came to America. Well, that's not true either, because when uh, EMI decided to do a 30th anniversary CD reissue of Sgt. Pepper, Jeff Emmerich flew to America with the master tape and went to master disc where Greg Calby was mastering. He had switched from Sterling to master disc for a few years. And Greg called me and said, um, do you know where I can get hold of a, a Studer like the one they have at Abbey Road that was used to originally master Sgt. Pepper? And I happened to know where one was. So my reward for getting them that Studer was to go to go to the studio and hear Sgt. Pepper, which is, and to see, meet Jeff Emmerich, which was, of course, a thrill. And I brought with me the um, Sgt. Pepper from this set. And I played it for Jeff Emmerich at Master Disc. And we got about four minutes or five minutes into it, and he goes, take that off, it's total rubbish. He hated it, and he hated it because of the equalization. So that's just Jeff Emmerich, but what does he know? And I called him in England a few months later about something else and uh, and I got his mother. Jeff lived at home with his mother and was, his mother, it was like a Monty Python sketch, his, his mother goes, Jeffy, it's for you, it's from America. <laughs> it was so funny. Anyway, be that as it may. So the, the lack of transparency started way back then. On the other hand, this original version of Waiting for Columbus, mastered by Stan Ricker, from the master tape, is one of the best sounding live records. I, I love, I'm a big Little Feet fan, and this is one of the best versions of Waiting for Columbus you are likely to ever hear. And I, even the original, I, th I think Doug Sachs cut, I'm not sure who cut the original, it may have been Doug Sachs. It's also fantastic, but this is even better, plated and pressed in Japan on, on JVC Super Vinyl. It's a great one. And then, um, so let's move forward a little bit in time. Oh, there's one other thing I wanted to show you, and that is, um, so this is the UHQR, Mobile Fidelity Sgt. Pepper, that was pressed from the same uh, stamper as the one that came out in the box. It, it just isn't that good. I'm sorry, it's not that good. Um, it's a UHQR flat profile. Anyway, this is still something nice to have, but I will say the one to have is the Pink Floyd. And Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, I sat here with, with a young man who was writing for me on my previous endeavor, uh, and we compared. Every, I have multiple versions of Dark Side of the Moon. I have that one. I have an early, early EMI pressing. I have um, the Toshiba Pro Use version. I have 
Oh, there was one that was very rare that was Kevin Gray and Doug Sachs got together and they mastered a version from the original tape and uh, that came out. I think you can you can get still get that around. It was pressed at Record Industry, I believe. But I had a test pressing from RTI. That's extremely rare. And it's, dis I don't know where, it could be here someplace, but it's disappeared, it's very frustrating. But anyway, we both decided that by far the best version of Dark Side of the Moon is the original mobile fidelity pressing. And I don't have the UHQR, I only have the original one, which is back there on the shelf. And it's, it was the best by, in every sense. It was the most transparent, it was the most, and, and the EQ was not overdone like some MoFi's of, of that era. You know, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, Stones was overdone. The, anyway, the, a lot of those were overdone in the bass. Too much bass. Uh, so that's that. Moving on. So then uh, MoFi basically uh, got out of uh, vinyl when vinyl sort of faded and they continued making CDs, gold CDs that were fine. And then uh, Herb Belkin, and I knew, I've known Herb Belkin, well, he's passed away now, but I knew Herb Belkin right from the beginning. And when Herb decided to get back into the vinyl business with these Anadisc 200 records, which are very difficult to make, um, he called me and a bunch of other journalists, and we got together in, I think it was Las Vegas, and had dinner, and he explained what he was going to do and, all, and the new plans for these records. And uh, so this is that one. And, you know, MoFi's been having this strip across the top from the beginning. They've never changed that. Their packaging is not about authenticity as much as it's about their take on the record, and they make it their own. And so, you know, they went back to this white label, which was theirs. And this is also a Stan Ricker half speed master cut. These are very good. These are very, very good. And um, this is a, it's a promo copy. Yes, I get promo records. And you know what? I've been getting promo records since 1972 when I was a disc jockey. Promo records are part of the industry, and they always have been. If you've been a reader of High Fidelity and Stereo Review or Cream or you read Lester Bangs or follow any critic out there, I don't care his name, he got promo records. And that doesn't mean that you're corrupt, and I just want to say that, that I've been accused of being corrupt because I get promo records and I'm on the gravy train and you can say I'm being defensive and I really don't care because I'm fed up with that kind of stuff. Promo records have been around since the 1950s and I can pull out a lot of them. In fact, I'm gonna pull one out right now. Here's a promo record of Nuggets. You guys know this is, this is a fantastic psychedelic compilation put together by Lenny Kay and this came out in 1972 on Electra. See, it's our promo record. And the reason why I have this record is because I cut the national radio spot that ran all over the country for this record. And so the promo man gave me the promo copy and said, use this to make your cuts and put, take a minute and put as many tracks as you could fit into a minute and, and talk about it, which I did. And here's a letter from Lenny Kay thanking me. And uh, that's kind of cool. So this was great. So the Anadis 200 series was really, really good. Then MoFi got sold, and uh, Jim Davis bought MoFi, and he decided to get back into the vinyl business at the right time, which he did. And MoFi started making records again. And some were not very good, and some were good. This is, this is the later version of Waiting for Columbus. This was done in 2000. And uh, by the way, anybody who thinks that I give all great reviews to MoFi's because I get them as promos, you haven't read my reviews. So this one from 2010, this is before MoFi got involved in, in a digital chain of, from analog. This sounds dead. It's muddy sounding. It's not very good. I don't know what was going on with their, with their uh, mastering chain, but uh, not very good. In fact, most of the little feats that were part of this series were not very good. And that's what I wrote. If you compare 
this to this, not even close. In fact, rather than getting this, if you find an original Warner Brothers pressing, you're much better off. Some good, some bad. Uh, this was the epitome of greatness from Mobile Fidelity. This, this record is absolutely, and that's why it goes for a lot of money. A lot, a lot of money. This is a black one. I think there's a pink one that goes for even more money. And this one is like one of MoFi's best, best mastering efforts. And this is from 2009, I believe. So, and I'm, you know, I'm pretty certain that Mobile Fidelity was able to get original master tapes directly from the label. And they used it for this. And in fact, the, uh, the tape of this is slight, is different than the uh, the other the Geffen version that, that came out. There's some studio chatter at the beginning of a track. I, I didn't forensically go through this entirely to find all the differences, but it may be a totally different tape or a slightly different mix or some of the tracks were different. But there's some studio chatter on here that's not on the one that came out from Geffen. But if you look, this is one of the great records, one of Beck's great records, and uh, this was a great record for Mobile Fidelity. Okay. Um, the Elvis Costello catalog was another one of uh, MoFi's great achievements, as far as I'm concerned. These are all wonderfully done, and this is from, and they did have the master tapes on this, I know that for a fact. And this is from 2011, so I believe uh, it was before they got digital in the chain. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I have an original of this, which is a, which is a 33 and a third, cut it for, I, I requested Mobile Fidelity to do this as a double 45. Why? Because it's a very long record. And the American one is squeezed all onto one side. And if you look, you, you see there's like fake ring wear on there? See, that? It, it looks like ring wear, but it's part of the artwork. It's on both sides. It's not on the American version, because they were afraid that, uh, that people would see that and think it was real ring wear and not buy it. <laughs> it's just crazy. And Mofi went back to the original artwork, and it's a joke, and it's funny, and Elvis like that joke and he put it on there and I've got uh, I can show you the original British has the same thing 20 hits on one record so this actually sounds pretty good considering it's 20 hits on one record but a friend of mine in California when I lived out there my friend Matt Leach who who uh, was doing stage management for bands on uh, stage management at that time he had a 2 LP white label promo that was cut at 45 as a promo and he let me borrow it and take it home, and it was it's it was incredible. It was, and I said to Mofi, "Do this as a double 45," and they did. And you know, I'm not even sure this catalog uh, was that successful for them, which is really nuts. This is like this whole Elvis catalog is to me is is essential for any any rock any rock person. But at any rate, and, and their the version they did of uh, of Elvis and Burt Bacharach is uh, which didn't come out on vinyl otherwise. It was an analog tape. The version they did of that is phenomenal. So, on the other hand, this one of my favorite records of all time, and it and uh, this was done in two thousand and sixteen, I believe. Two thousand and sixteen. I'm assuming it's done on their digital chain. I can only assume it because they don't, they're not saying. But, you know, all these records say ultra-analog. They gain to ultra-analog system. If it's an ultra-analog system, your expectation is that it's all analog. Isn't that what your expectation is if it's called... The, if they didn't call it the really good system. They called it ultra-analog. At any rate, I reviewed this. It's a double 45. It's n not that good. I didn't give it a good review. It didn't sound right to me. It sounded kind of soft and lacking in presence and you know but I didn't write maybe this is digital because I assumed that they're cutting from tape as they as they promised but it's possible this is one of the early 2016 cut from digital and compared to a, an original pressing of this or compared to the ERC pressing that came out later cut with tube system Something's not right about this, and I wrote that, and they were very unhappy with me. But I don't. I'm not in this to to, to make friends among the record labels, folks. I'm here to try to tell you the truth about what I hear, whether you agree with what I hear or not. That wasn't very good. 
Let's move forward to another point of contention in this world, and that is Mobile Fidelity's Miles Davis catalog. All right. This is where Fremer proves he can't hear. He says he can always hear digital, but maybe he can't. He's a liar. You know, if that stuff was going through your brain, if you were me and that stuff was going through your brain, even though people say to me, they say, you know, you know, Mikey, let it go, because these people are trolls, and you're you and they're not you, and they're just angry, let it go. It's not easy to do that. It's not easy. I don't mind if they disagree with me. I don't care if they say my my hearing's no good anymore. I don't care about anything like that. But the charges that I'm corrupt, that I'm a criminal, it's not nice. It's not pleasant. And it's part of what's happening in our culture today. And I don't like it. And I'm not, a, I don't have to like it. All right. Anyway, everyone who's a Miles Davis fan, and these are the original two eye pressings that I've had since they first came out. This, I was around then and I was a jazz fan, even as a, as a young man. All the original two eye pressings. Everyone who bought these when they first came out, especially the ones that <clears throat> that owned all the early Mileses on Columbia, uh, you know, Kind of Blue and Sketches of Spain, all those records. When they heard these, it was like, what? What happened? These are not good sounding records. Even though it was Fred Plout, Fred Plout and Ray Moore, two great engineers, something happened. And these never sounded great music. I mean, don't get me wrong, great music never sounded good. And then Mobile Fidelity got the catalog and did the, here are the, just these, I'm just showing you this one and I'm showing you this one. And as we learned from the video the other day, these were cut from DSD masters and they sound great, much better than the originals. But what we would need to have to know exactly what's going on, Marvin Gaye uh, comment there, is to hear the same tapes transferred all analog, hear an all analog version of the same tape and compare it to the digital version. And the guys at MoFile say, well, we did that and we, you know, this is better. Okay, I think if you're going to call it Game 2 Ultra Analog System, it should be an analog recording and it should be an analog mastering. That's my feeling about this. And we learned these aren't. These do sound great. And you know what? If you don't buy these because they're digital, because they're, you know, D double DSD or four times DSD, which is much better than low resolution PCM. You know, digital is not digital. Digital is MP3. Digital is 16 bit 44K. Digital is 96, 24, et cetera, et cetera, up to DSD and, and DXD, which is 392, 32 bit. These sound great regardless of anything. And it doesn't prove that you can't here digital you have to once you get up to that kind of resolution it's much more difficult the only way you could possibly know if you hear it or not is to hear the same tape transferred all analog and i don't want to get into that argument and i've never claimed i can always hear digital but most of the time if it's a 9624 digitization cut to vinyl versus an original pressing that's good you can hear it you can hear it at any rate these are great regardless of how they were cut. Now let's get to the latest bone of contention. So this is what's going on. The one step that was done from their uh, DSD, not analog tape. This sounds fantastic. I gave it a great review. Some of these one steps don't sound so good and I didn't bother to review them. And um, this one sounds great. I did not compare it to Kevin Gray's all analog cut. I should get that and do it, but you know what? I've got this, I've got an original pressing. This is much, the original Tamla pressing, a lot of those original Motowns and Tamlas sound absolutely fantastic. That one doesn't. Uh, yeah, I should get an original, I should get Kevin's cut and compare it to this. Kevin's cut was all analog. And from what people have told me, they prefer Kevin's cut to this. There's also uh, a developing story that I'm going to cover about people in the industry who will, will name themselves, who don't think that the one-step process produces better results. In fact, what's interesting is somebody emailed me and said, boy, I wish, I wish Doug Sachs was still around because Doug Sachs, you know, he was one of the greatest. Well, guess what? Doug Sachs 
experimented in the 90s with one steps. And Doug Sachs's opinion, and these were done at RTI, Doug Sachs's opinion was that they don't sound as good as three steps. I don't yet know why, but I'm going to get to the bottom of that, and we'll find out why. And that's an opinion, okay? That's not, a, this is all opinion. Whatever sounds best to you is what matters. But anyway, th this sounds great under any circumstances. Uh, now let's get to these. I have this and couldn't stand the weather. And these do not sound remotely as good as the ones that Analog Productions did from the original Analog tapes when Sony was still allowing them out to Sterling Sound. It's not close. And whatever it was that I didn't like, it was this was these were soft sounding and diffuse. And I had a friend over who was in the business. I said, look, let me just play you couldn't stand the weather. We played Tin Pan Alley. And there's that part of Tin Pan Alley where he's a shot rang out, boom. And you know, you could hear that track for twenty years in a row. You could hear that track every day for twenty years in a row. And uh on the orig on the AP version, when that shot rings, you you jump. You're, it's a reflex you cannot help have. When you play the one step, you go, oh, somebody got shot. I'm not kidding. Every single person I played that for, without reservation, without saying which is which, there, that one's like, eh. that's just the truth from my perspective. So I'm going to go to the Pacific Audio Show next week. I'm going to bring both couldn't stand the weathers. As much as I try not to play play Tin Pan Alley or go into rooms that are playing Tin Pan Alley because I'm tired of it. And I'm going to play them for people and I'm not going to say which is which and I just want to know what they think. Which is what I did with the Carol King Tapestry on my previous Endeavors website. I digitized uh, one song from Tapestry so far away and I digitized um, the one that Chris Bellman cut from the tape directly AAA. And at the time that I did it, I didn't know that they were digitizing their sources at MoFi. I just knew that that version didn't sound right. It sounded like equalization was messed up. It was the, it was just too much bass. There's a kick drum on that song, and it just like was boom. It was like a depth charge. But I digitized both tracks. I didn't say which was which. I digitized them at 9624. And yeah, this degradation granted. So I'm not being hypocritical. I understand that. But still, it's an even test. The levels were different, and I didn't want to touch, I didn't want to mess with uh, normalization or mess with the levels. I just said, when you play these back, get the levels to be the same. And most of the readers on that site were pretty sophisticated and have SPL meters, and they can play them back level. And, and it came back 70 to 30. 70% 70 of the readers preferred it's a blind test, preferred the Chris Bellman version. That's all I'm saying. And this is not attacking anybody. This is just getting to some facts. Now, why they preferred it? There were various reasons, not only having to do with the equalization. But whatever it was, this is before we had any idea of what Mobile Fidelity is actually doing with their one steps.